Thank you for being with us today. I'm Butch Howard, and I'm coming to you from the campus of Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. I hope that you have had another good week, and you are counting God's blessings in your life and your family. As we uh, now approach the last uh, 10 days or so of the month of June, the year is passing so swiftly, and as we continue our study in God's Word, uh, this new series, I hope, uh, has proven already to be a blessing and helpful to you in your understanding of the Scriptures. Today we will do our second session, uh, and a very important one. I hope that today's session will be especially helpful to you. Our uh, thought today is why the Old Testament is vital reading for today. So many so-called New Testament Christians have the idea that the Old Testament uh, is irrelevant, and so they do not spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Today, we hope to change your thinking on some of, uh, of that as we move through our study. There are, of course, many needs. Uh, uh, many of you have been keeping up with our senior pastor, Eddie Cooper. As you know, he is once again battling leukemia, uh, and he is in the hospital uh, at uh, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, we hope that you will remember Pastor Eddie today in your prayers and his wife, Lori, as they are away from us, uh, having some further testing uh, done there to help the doctors better uh, understand uh, his particular needs and a treatment plan for him. And we have others, of course, in our church family, many needs. And I know that you, too, have needs that you take to the Lord every day in prayer. I'm glad that I can say to you, I have experienced the power of prayer in my own life. God has answered prayers throughout my life, and I'm thankful that we can go to Him regardless of the challenges that we face, regardless of the cares of life. Our Heavenly Father is present and ready to hear, and ready to answer. And so we go to him in prayer. We want to do that as we look into the scriptures today. You can be finding your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll pick up there right after we pray. Now, Father, as we bow, we are thankful for all of your blessings. And Lord, today we ask that as we come together, that in these few moments that we have, that you will enable us to push aside the many cares of life, the burdens that press so heavily upon us. Lord, you know our hearts and our minds. You know our needs, every detail of our lives. And tonight, Lord, we ask your blessings. We ask your presence. We ask your intervention uh, in these things that are so heavy upon the hearts of so many. We always ask you, Father, to open our hearts to your word and open your word to our hearts. Lord, enable us through the power of your Holy Spirit to see new truth to us, truth that, Lord, has been hidden from the ages, as the Holy Spirit said to the Apostle Paul. But today we ask that you will turn the light on in the hearts and lives of your children so that as we read, as we study, as we consider we will learn those things that you have for us at this present time. Teach us to apply your word the way you desire it to be applied, to obey your word fully and completely, and yes, Lord, even joyfully. And we will thank you now for all that's accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Why the Old Testament is vital reading for today. The Apostle Paul who in his day was, at that time, to use the word modern, would have applied to his own generation. And here's what he said to the church at Corinth, which in that time, in that historical period, Corinth was a major city in the world. It was a major city in the Roman Empire. It was vibrant with life, with commerce, and all sorts of cultural uh, more is going on from the various people uh, from many races, many cultures that lived in the city of Corinth. So it was by all uh, 
considerations, a very modern metropolis, uh, much like our cities of New York or Atlanta or somewhere else. So he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, writing to believers, I would not have you to be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He is referring to the exodus and he's referring to the journey across the Sinai Desert and approaching uh, the land of Canaan. All were baptized or immersed unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual, here it is, see the capital R, that spiritual rock that followed them. Now notice what he says next. Here's the interpretation. Under Holy Spirit inspiration, that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For that, they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. These old, ancient, historical events happened and were recorded Paul says, for our example, that is the moderns of his own time. Today, in the 21st century, as we read these words of the Apostle Paul, these things were for our examples as well. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He reads on through 7, 8, and 9, and 10. But I want to get us to verse 11 for sake of time. We have much material to cover today. So in verse 11 he says, Now all, not some, but all these things happened unto them. For examples. And they are written for our admonition upon which the end, ends of the world are come. Now, Paul believed he was in the last days, just like you and I believe we are in the last days. He talked about Jesus returning for the church. We talk about Jesus returning for the church. We have the same mentality that we are approaching an imminent event in the return of Jesus Christ for his church. So these things that were examples in the Old Testament to uh, the Apostle Paul's generation, they still remain examples for our generation here in the 21st century. Now, a lot of New Testament people, they really are reluctant to accept the Old Testament. Outside of the Psalms and the Proverbs, a very little reading of the Old Testament scriptures by many, many, many Christians. What they fail to understand is that much of the New Testament, listen carefully, much of the New Testament is actually Old Testament quotations and references. Jesus himself quoted from, listen to this, 25 Old Testament books. There are 889 Catch that number, 889 quotations and references of the Old Testament in the New Testament. This is a huge percentage of the New Testament volume is actually Old Testament content. We read in this passage here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the Apostle Paul says these Old Testament events and these Old Testament saints, their, their experiences, their life stories are recorded here by divine design, by divine intent and purpose to be examples for us. So that brings us to the, the vital link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to look at a lot of things uh, today that will help us understand the, why the Old Testament is such vital reading today. Number one, I want you to see that the Pentateuch reveals the chief attributes and the nature of God. Now, when we talk about the Pentateuch, that might be a term that's uh, new to some Christians. When we use that term Pentateuch, we're referring to the first five books in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, 
Numbers and Deuteronomy. This is the Pentateuch. These are called the Torah by the Jews, and they contain the law of God. We need to understand that in these five books, God reveals to us his person. The primary purpose of the Bible, listen very carefully, make no mistake here. The primary purpose of the Holy Bible is to reveal God to man. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, the triune God, the God of the Bible is revealed to humanity in the Bible. That is the chief purpose of this book before us. And the Pentateuch reveals the chief attributes and nature of God. Now, a lot of people today want to throw off the, the Mosaic Law and the Pentateuch, these first five books of the law. The reason for that is, in these five books, God is very direct. He is very narrow if you will, in where he draws the line between right and wrong, good and evil, pleasing and displeasing, so that we learn in these first five books how God sees man, how God sees sin and what sin is to God. So it's very important. The Pentateuch reveals the character and the nature of God. The Pentateuch also reveals God's law for humanity. We read verses throughout those first five books where God commands Israel, God commands the reader to do all of the law, not some of it, not the parts you like, and you're not to rewrite it, you're not to rearrange it, you're not to reinterpret it. You are to Obey the law of God. In fact, he tells Joshua, don't turn to the right hand nor turn to the left hand. Keep the law of God. So the Pentateuch reveals the nature and attributes of the person of God. It also reveals his law to us. Number three, the Pentateuch, again, those first five books of the Bible, reveal how God directs our personal journey through life. It is an amazing series of stories. And we all grew up, uh, if you have a church background in your childhood, you grew up in what was commonly referred to as Sunday school. The teachers taught us as little children, we, we learned about Adam and Eve. We learned about Cain and Abel. We learned about Noah. We learned about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We learned about Joseph, and we learned about Moses and others. What we sometimes fail to remember as adults is that God reveals how he directs our lives through the lives of these Old Testament people. It doesn't stop with just a Pentateuch, but some of the most famous, most well-loved and renowned stories of the Bible come right out of these first five books of the Bible. We think about how God pick Noah out of a generation of wicked human beings. He chose Noah to preserve Noah, to preserve the human race. And on and on the stories come. The life of Joseph is an amazing story. Moses, raised in Pharaoh's house, but later returns to liberate uh, Israel from uh, Egyptian bondage. So the Pentateuch reveals how God directs our personal journey through life. Now, one of the things we learn from this is that when God works in individual lives, he uses all of his omnipotent and infinite resources. He does amazing supernatural things. Remember when he called Moses in the wilderness, he set a bush on fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. It did not burn. He then takes Moses and he works a series of miracles in the form of plagues. So many times we find God doing the supernatural in the realm of the natural, in the eyes of human beings to show his omnipotent power. He directs the personal journey that we have uh, through this, this world, and it's so very important. The Jews that were born in Egypt became enslaved by the culture, and, of course, by the authorities of the Egyptian Empire. 
They went there as a haven under God's instructions. God said to, to, uh, to Jacob it was all right to go, and he went down there. The nation becomes enslaved. And we, we learn very quickly that uh, over the course of that bondage, God began to work in Israel. The Jews that were born there grew up under that culture. They grew up under uh, a, a foreign, uh, idolatrous uh, culture. Much similar to the way the rest of the world has, has since evolved uh, after uh, the ancient days. It's a powerful narrative that God sovereignly, yet compassionately, leads his chosen people. Now, a lot of people today, we'll talk about this much more as we get into latter parts of the Old Testament, but it's so very important, dear child of God, today that, that we understand God is sovereign over everyone and everything, everywhere, all the time. He raises up nations, he raises up leaders, and he brings them down. Everything happening in the world today is going along under God's sovereign rule and control. The Jews felt as though they were going to be just absolutely eradicated and, and destroyed under the Egyptian uh, tyranny and the viciousness uh, of, of that regime, and yet God sovereignly preserved them. We also learned that as we move through uh, the Pentateuch, we get into Exodus, we learn that God's not so much concerned with getting Israel out of Egypt, listen carefully, as he was getting Egypt out of Israel. From the moment we get saved, God is more concerning with getting us separate from the world, getting us away from that, that carnal, fallen human perspective and bring us to a place where we literally have his perspective of life. And we're moving as citizens of the promised land, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So that, that's, uh, that's what the Exodus teaches us. Well, not only that, we come to the historical books. When we talk about the historical books, we're mainly talking about Joshua uh, and Judges, the Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, these are all part of, uh, of a different era. Uh, they record the early history of the nation of Israel. God is in history. Someone once said it this way. I love it. History is his story. He is story. It doesn't mean that everything that happens throughout history pleases God. It does mean that everything that happens in history is under God's control. It's under God's timing. It will move in accordance to God's eternal will and purpose. So Joshua teaches us about our spiritual enemies. He teaches us about spiritual warfare. He teaches us about the ultimate deliverance in the promised land. And he teaches us about kingdom living. As we move to the judges and the kings and the chronicles, these, uh, the judges, of course, was that period of time before the kings. And, and God raised up specific individuals that would lead Israel for a period of time. Uh, in a time of crisis generally. And, and of course, uh, many of them are there. Samuel was there. Uh, we find Samson is there. Uh, Deborah is there. Uh, there are a list of these judges, and they served at a critical time in Israel's history. They, they, they served the Lord in a time basically very similar to our day and time, that every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's the key verse in the book of Judges. It's a key thought. Today, situation, uh, ethics, uh, secularism, uh, our morality that we have going on everywhere, this modern-day insanity is all about people just doing what they want to do without wanting the consequences that go with them. So the judges served in such a time as that. The kings and the chronicles the Chronicles really are the stories of the kings as well. And we are reminded through these books in the Old Testament about how human authorities ultimately walk away from God. 
Now, in Genesis chapter 12, God instituted human government. No mistake. God instituted human government. It was a tool God used to manage humanity. He still uses human government. Now he has added the New Testament church. There have been, there have been these eras of time where God has moved in certain specific, very direct ways uh, to manage human uh, life and human activity. And in these historical books, we learn that human authorities cannot be trusted. We do not trust human government. It doesn't mean that we hate human government. It doesn't mean that we hate human beings, that we hate people. You know, we all have our jokes about the politicians. We have, we have that, if you will, skepticism about their integrity, many of them. And some have proven very unreliable. Others, uh, there's still huge question marks about their, their integrity and, of course, uh, their motives of what they do. Ultimately, these things teach us, just as we learn in the historical books, that we cannot put our confidence in man. We cannot put our confidence and our trust in human government. We come to the poetical books. These are some of the favorite Old, time, Old Testament writings for every one of us. Uh, we think about Job. We think about Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Lamentations. Uh, these are just chock full of great poetry. Many of them are Old Testament Hebrew hymns and songs that were sang in worship. There, there's much wisdom found for us in the, the words of Solomon in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the melancholy lamentations of Jeremiah. These poetical books are very, very, very important because in these books, God teaches us how to please him in worship. We learn what moves his heart. We learn how to communicate through prayer, through praise, through song, through worship uh, to our Heavenly Father. In these poetical books, we also learn God's view of the wicked. The psalmists, as they write the various uh, narratives through psalm, are very explicit, very direct, sometimes very, uh, very blunt in the terminology. The wicked... Uh, are, are have a very have a very uh, dark place in in God's thinking. God hates the wicked. The Bible says he is he is angry with the wicked. The psalmist says every day. Now he wants them saved, but he hates their wickedness. Now a lot of people have a problem with uh, the idea that how can a loving God have this same attitude about wicked? There are two sides to the same being. I often use this example uh, when dealing with this love-anger uh, dynamic. Every one of us who are parents, we have had those occasions in our parenting where we very much love our child or our children, and yet our child, our children, have done things, said things, and gotten themselves involved in things that we very much disliked and that even provoked anger in us. We all know moms and dads, that did not cause us to stop loving our children. The anger was not a replacement of love. In fact, our anger was an expression of that love. We understood that those bad behaviors, many times bad attitudes, were going to guide them to a place of destruction rather than blessing. So our, our righteous anger swells up and we say to our children, that behavior is not appropriate and we will not stand for that. God is the same way. We, re we learned that behavior from him. He is a loving God, but he can be an angry God. This is why Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's very important the poetical books give us this wonderful, wonderful window into what pleases the Lord. It gives us a window into God's view of the wicked. It gives us a window into what spiritual wisdom looks like in everyday life. We learn from the Proverbs some wonderful, wise precepts and principles. 
it helps us understand how wisdom is applied in human behavior. So we've come through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. We've come through the historical books. We've come into the poetical books, and we've learned some powerful, powerful things up to the book of Lamentations. From this book of Lamentations back to Genesis chapter 1, can we not see how vital, how essential the Old Testament is to our day and time? I cannot imagine life in the 21st century without the Old Testament. Now, you may have challenges in reading and understanding some of that. We all do. You say, Brother Butch, we get over into the genealogies, especially in Genesis and some of the other, uh, the recounting of history and numbers in Deuteronomy. Yes, I know. Those genealogies are, are very, very challenging passages of Scripture. And many of us might say, well, why did God record these things? Why didn't he not just skip over? The names of those people in these genealogies, they contribute to the historical validity, the authenticity of the Word of God. They also, we will study these people's lives that are mentioned in these genealogies. They have many things in their lives that we can learn from. That takes us back to what we read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them, to those people, for examples. And they were written for our admonition. As we move forward, we begin to look at the Old Testament prophets. For many New Testament Christians, the Old Testament prophets are much akin to the book of Revelation in the New Testament they are afraid of these authors and these books. It is true there is, some, there is some very dark language there. There are figures and there are symbols. There are, there's, there's a grammatical structure that is very, very challenging to our understanding. And this is why it's so important, and we stress this over and over in our study of the Word of God. We must engage the Holy Spirit as we study the Scriptures. I would not advocate to any person, saved or lost, to try to study the Word of God apart or independent of the Holy Spirit. It would be a foolish endeavor. The Bible says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God Neither can he know them. We must have spiritual illumination, which comes only from the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, that same passage I just quoted says to us that we have his spirit, and these things have been given to us who are his. Now, what that means is that as we open this book, as we prayerfully, diligently study, as we wait upon the Holy Spirit, God will show us the things we need to know. He will never show us everything. We don't need to know everything. You say, well, so-and-so seems to have a deeper, better, wider understanding of Scripture than I do. Dear child of God, please understand, I believe this is with every fiber of my being, that if you will avail yourselves to the Scripture, if you will study under Holy Spirit uh, filling and direction and guidance, illumination, God the Holy Spirit will reveal to you exactly what you need for your journey, for your life. He is not obligated to give you the same content nor the same understanding level of some other believer. God has called that person to a different path. They have a different mission. They have other needs, and God will reveal to them what they need to know. This is the wonder of that personal intimacy with the Holy Spirit. He walks with us. He resides with us. He understands us. 
He knows our groanings. He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives and our desires. And he alone is qualified and capable to reveal the word of God to us for our individual needs and for our mission in the kingdom and for our place in the local church. This is why it's so important that we get the Holy Spirit to join us in our study of the scriptures. We're told to study. We're told to seek the Holy Spirit. We're told to pray for illumination and guidance, and God will reveal these things to us. But as we get into the Old Testament, the first thing we learn from the Old Testament prophets is they warn us of the consequences of rebellion against God. It's very, very important that we understand this. They lived in national decline. They lived in a time when the nations of Israel and Judah, one time a unified nation, divided by sin, immorality, rebellion against God. Does that sound familiar to you? Israel, which was one, became two. And even among the two, there were splinters because people was walking away from God. They were doing their own thing in their own way, and they were trying to avoid the wrath of God. They refused to consider the solemn messages of the prophets. The prophets teach us of the dire consequences of rebellion against God. The psalmist said this, and it's borne out in the prophets, all nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. When a nation departs from God, God raises up wicked leadership. And those wicked leaders take the nation further away from God. And eventually those wicked leaders will take that nation right into eternal judgment and divine wrath. God destroys nations that abandon him. So, we learn from the Old Testament prophets the consequences of rebellion against God. The greatest thing America could do today, the greatest thing the nations of Europe, to any nation of living and alive today, the nations today need to get this message that when we rebel against God, the consequences will be cataclysmic and can be existential. We need to understand this. Not only that, but their, their lives of, say, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Hosea, others, their lives become models for us that help us understand how to live faithfully even in the presence of national decline. Many of us my age and older remember an America very, very different than the America we are seeing today. We... Uh, we lament the, the old days, and some of the younger folks, uh, they laugh at us, and they mock some of the uh, memories of simpler times that we sometimes want to relive. They don't understand. It wasn't about the simpler life. It was about a life that was free of the garbage and the sin and the evil and the wickedness, the violence and perversion that we see so rampant, just flowing in our streets, that, that just splashed over our screens on television, our movie houses. There was a time when these things were absolutely forbidden in the United States of America. And they were forbidden because they violated the most basic sensibilities of human morality. When we think about these, we need to understand that as we read these great prophets of old, they teach us how to, to live faithfully even in the presence of national decline. Now, you and I hope that God does not destroy America. I, I hope that I don't live to see the day that the United States no longer exists as uh, a nation, a sovereign nation. I hope that day never comes. We are moving swiftly in that direction. But if we do, and as we continue to decline as a nation, the prophets give us so many wonderful principles of guidance, light and insight to help us 
live the life that will still please God. In every one of these generations, for several hundred years, God raised up prophets. And these prophets served him faithfully regardless of the backlash, regardless of the oppression, the isolation, and the persecution, and even martyrdom. They refused to compromise. They refused to recant. They refused to back up. They preached and taught and lived according to the word of God. Now, dear friend across America today, if you're saved, if you're a child of, the, of God and a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are duty-bound. We are obligated to live for God in the midst of our nation's decline. We pray for revival. We want revival, but we must not compromise. We must hold true to the precious word of God. We see how they lived, and it's time for us to take their words, but also their lives, their examples to heart, and live faithfully for God, regardless of where culture, where the trends, where the politics where all of this may be going, we must draw a straight line and stand firm. There will be consequences for this just as they face consequences in their day. But the Bible records that ultimately they were right. The prophets in the Old Testament show us how to cling to the promises of God. When we get over to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter, uh, he begins chapter 3 by, by making this statement. He said, they'll come in the last days those who scoff and mock, and they say, where is the promise of his coming? For things still remain like they always have. The mockery is that this Jesus you say is returning. It's been long, long ago. These promises were made, and still nothing the Old Testament prophets held on to the promises God made to Israel even hundreds of years before. They clung to the, to the promises of a coming Messiah that would still be hundreds of years in the future. Many times we modern believers, we really, we've got this mindset that things can't get any worse. We have this mindset that Jesus must be going to come today or tomorrow, that, that he just can't possibly wait much longer. I would remind us of that mentality, that the Bible never promises. The Bible doesn't tell us when he's coming. The Bible promises he is coming. There were 400 years, get that number, 400 years from Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, to Matthew in the New Testament. 400 years. This period of 400 years still ranks as some of the darkest centuries in all of human history. Nothing is well known about this 400 years. From a biblical perspective, God was silent. God was distant. 400 years. I have no idea if the world will continue 400 more years. It looks dark. It looks like the coming of Jesus is imminent. But the truth of the matter is, dear Christian, we don't know when Jesus is coming. That does not in any way remove the power of of the promises God has made to us. The prophets teach us how to cling to these divine promises. There's nothing, nothing more important for us today than to maintain our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ made a very interesting statement in the form of a question to his disciples one day. He was teaching and he made this statement in the form of a question and it's still, in my mind, perhaps the most eerie thing Jesus ever uttered in his ministry. Here's what he said. Listen carefully. When the Son of Man cometh, not if the Son of Man cometh, when the Son of Man cometh, 
will he find faith in the earth? Well, you say if he comes today or tomorrow, he's going to find faith in the earth. We're waiting on him. We're looking for him. We're anticipating his return. Jesus also said to the disciples, in a day when you think not, the Son of Man comes. All of us thinking now Jesus is coming just any minute. He could come any day. And, of course, Eminent says he can come any day. But there are passages that certainly teach us that in the day that we're not thinking about him coming will be the time he actually comes. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? To me, that's ominous. It suggests there may be a period of time. There may be an entire era of spiritual darkness and faithlessness in the earth where there is only a small remnant of faith remaining. I don't know. We must understand and we must hold true to the faith that God has given to us. The prophets help us with this. We learn from these prophets how to cling to these promises. There's a little chorus we used to sing as children in our church. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, every promise in the book is mine. In these days when things seem so upside down, so discombobulated, so chaotic, confusing, it's time that we cling to the promises of God. The prophets in the Old Testament do this. Daniel was a fervent prayer. He interceded before God. He believed God's promises. So did Isaiah. So did Jeremiah. So did Ezekiel. These prophets stood firm in the face of national decline. They stood firm in the face of spiritual evil and darkness all around them. Now, we've come to the end of our time today as we consider why the, the Old Testament matters is a vital for our reading today, I hope that what we've said so far, and we didn't quite finish, we've got several more points that we want to make here, but I hope that what we've said today is provoked within you a new interest in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not saying it will be easy, but God will reward you, dear child of God. Now that you lost people, you can't possibly understand the Old Testament. You'll read it, and you'll come up with your own, your own ideas, your own human reasoning. But if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit, God will teach you what you need to know of the Old Testament. I challenge you, I encourage you, get back to the Old Testament. Begin to read those precious, precious truths that now on our side of time happened thousands of years ago. God will bless your heart as you read again the Old Testament, and I hope that by revisiting the Old Testament, it will give you a new look at the Bible. You can reach out to me at butch at appalachbaptistchurch.org. I really would love to hear from you. Until this time next week, happy Father's Day, and God bless you.